Hello and thank you for watching this whiteboard presentation video. My name is David Whittaker and I'm a thermal processing specialist at Camden BRI. So today I'm going to talk about one of the most important aspects of food safety, that is thermal process validation. Now during this short video we're going to outline the reasons for validation and discuss the, some of the methodologies using my whiteboard and some of these lovely drawings. Now no matter whether you produce canned foods, bottled beverages, or meat products, yes, that's meant to be a leg of ham, and everything else in between, you're likely to use heat to actually reduce or eliminate the microorganisms um, that are present in the food, i.e. a thermal process is applied. These microorganisms could potentially spoil the product over its, product, over its shelf life, or actually could cause harm. They're pathogenic microorganisms that could cause harm and therefore it's imperative to get the thermal process right because if you don't then the product produced could be potentially a danger to public health. So for that reason really it's absolutely vital to, uh, to get that thermal processing right and that's what I've, and evidence is required to be able to prove that the manufacturer has done that. And that's what a thermal process validation study is. It's evidence to show that the thermal process has been applied properly every single time. And that minimum level of thermal, of, of thermal treatment on the food has been applied each time, every day. So how do we undertake a thermal process validation study? Well, there's many ways of doing it. We could use microbiological methods or even using enzymes. But one of the most straightforward and commonly used methods is by actually just measuring the temperature of, of the products going through the, the thermal process and using that temperature data to understand if a minimum target has been hit to reduce or eliminate that specific level of microorganisms in the food. So we're going to use temperature sensors and those or any type of temperature measurement equipment you know wireless or wired sensors, thermocouples we just need to take the measurement of the product through time, through the thermal process. And we also need to do that a couple of times at least. And we need to absolutely understand all the variables that are associated with that thermal process that could affect it. And for each variable, we need to make sure we know that for our validation runs, the worst case scenario of that variable has been applied. Well, what do I mean by that? But we're talking about things that could affect heating either within the product itself or within the actual, or actually the equipment, the cooker, the retort, the oven, different variables that could actually affect heating. For example, the size of my joint of ham, making sure that we use the biggest samples and the, and the meat is loaded to the highest level um, in the, throughout the process when we're validating, or the fill level of our bottle of juice or the viscosity of our products in the can. Even equipment uh, variables need to be considered. I've mentioned loading and also you know, the amount of racks or trolleys that are in the retort or the oven all need to be considered. So we need to make sure we understand what variables are having an impact on our process because it can be different for every product, for every, every um, type of thermal process. And when we've understood that, making sure we've controlled these variables to make sure they're set to a specific worst case level and that only then we can actually undertake our validation runs where we actually put the food through the process with temperature measurement equipment attached. So when we've understood that we need then to figure out two more key points before we can do our final, our final validation run number three, the heat penetration. The two key points we still need to understand which might involve extra testing are the temperature distribution within the cooking vessel, the retort, and the cold spot within the product. So temperature distribution is normally some extra testing that's involved to understand where within our process, um, where within our process is the coldest point in the environment. So often, maybe this could be two trolleys in an oven or two, two crates in a retort. Often we might find that the coldest point is here in the bottom. And we might find that crate A is colder than crate B. Or sometimes if it's a rotary system, we might find that it's in the middle. 
But we need to do some testing, temperature distribution testing, to understand that. Because whichever position we choose, let's say it's crate A at the bottom, that's the position we're going to put our actual final validation samples in part three. We also need to understand the in product cold point or cold spot. Because the heating on the product could vary. For example, this bottle could be slowest heating here in the middle, or it could be at the bottom here. Same with a can. Maybe you have two points where you'd need to investigate. And our ham, our leg of ham, our, our joints, how do we know whether the, the flesh is the slowest point, slowest point of heating or next to the bone? So we might need to do some more testing, and we'd call that testing in product, in product cold spot analysis. So we need to understand, so we need to do our tests for temperature distribution in product cold spot. And from the data we get from that, that informs us what our worst case position is for our samples in the, in the cooking vessel, and it informs us of our worst case pro position in the actual product itself. So maybe it's here, or maybe we find that it's by the bone here. So we, we've understood all our variables. We then do ideally free runs, free replicate runs of heat penetration, where we're actually putting our final validation samples probed up through the process. And what we recommend, and what's generally expected, is free runs with free samples on each run. Alternatively, we could do two runs with 10 samples if that's more practical. We then are going to actually obtain some data, and it might be in a nice graphical format like this, and that data is going to, get, is going to inform us whether we've hit that minimum level of heat treatment or not. If we have, then great, the product is safely validated. If not, we need to stop, stop what we're doing, start again and rethink the process. So please look out for my next video when we're actually going to look at analysing some of this data and understand how the data can be used to further optimise our process.